I start here with a piece of that rope. Let's call this position x. And I call this position x plus delta x. I call this y. I call this angle theta plus delta theta. And I call this angle theta. We have a tension T on the line and mu is the mass per unit length. So you tell me what the mass per one meter is, and I know what mu is. It's the length, the mass per unit length. Well, if our displacements are not absurdly high, then we can make the same assumption that we made with the beaded string, that the tension is the same on both sides. It's an approximation, but for modest amplitudes, it's a very reasonable approximation. So we have a T here, and we have a T there, and they are then, to decent to a reasonable approximation, the same. Just like with the beats for modest amplitudes, we don't have to worry about motion in the X direction. The only thing that matters is the motion in the y direction. So I will concentrate exclusively on the motion in this direction which drives it back to equilibrium. And so f of y on this segment is then minus t sine theta because this component is down, minus t sine theta plus t sine theta plus delta theta. Because this component in the y direction is driving it away from equilibrium. But for small angles, and we have to have small angles, otherwise all our assumptions are wrong, t's are not the same. So for small angles, the sine of theta is the same as theta in radians. And so this becomes a theta, this becomes theta plus delta theta, and so this thing becomes t delta theta. That's an approximation for small angles. Now I will apply Newton's second law. The amount of mass that is in here is dm. And I will calculate shortly what dm is. It's a little bit of mass. We're going to make dx go to zero, infinitesimally small amount of mass. And so that mass times y double dot must now be this force that we just calculated. So it must be t delta theta. But what is dm? Well, we know that the length of the string is delta x, so dm must be delta x times mu, because mu is the amount of mass per unit length, and if my length is delta x, then dm is mu delta x. So I can write this now as delta x times mu times y double dot equals t times delta theta. We're getting there. Now, since we're in the limiting case, we're going to make delta x zero. The tangent of theta, so that's becoming then this direction. The tangent of theta is dy dx. Right? That is dy dx, and the reason why I use partial derivatives is that I think of it as the time not changing. At, at any moment in time, this is dy dx. That's the only justification for the partial derivative. I take the derivative on this side and on this side in x. So the left side, I take d tangent theta dx, and I do it on the right side. Now, the derivative of the tangent of theta, of the function, is 1 over the cosine squared of theta. That can take you more than 20 seconds to confirm that. You can do that in many different ways. 
So this is the derivative of the function itself. And then, of course, I have to multiply it by d theta dx. Because I take the whole function derivative in, in, in dx. And so here I get then d2y dx squared. But for small angle approximation, cosine square of theta is 1. And so I'm going to substitute now this result into my differential equation. I read this as delta theta, which is here, and I read this in my mind as delta x, which is here. Now, mathematicians would probably never do that, but physicists have no problems with that. So I'm going to write now here mu times delta x, and here I write d2y dt squared. I use partial derivatives because I'm not changing x. That's the justification for the partials. And now I get t, and now this delta theta, I'm going to write for this times delta x. So now you get delta x times d2y dx squared. And now I'm doing something that mathematicians would never do. I'm going to divide out delta x. Don't tell your 18 whatever people that I did that. <laughs> so now what you have is that mu divided by t times d2y dt squared, constant value of x, is now d2y dx squared. And believe it or not, that this is a big moment in our life. You have here a differential equation of y, which is a function of x and t, whereby here you take the double derivative in time, and here you take the double derivative in space, in location. What is a possible solution to this differential equation? You can just see it by looking at it. You immediately see what the solution must be. Any function, any single valued function, you can come up with any one, I don't care with which one, any single valued function of x plus or minus a constant times t will satisfy this differential equation. Just look at it. You can see immediately that it works. Take the second derivative in time. You get a c square out, and you get the second derivative of the function. Take the seventh, second derivative in x, you only get the second derivative of the function, and that's all. So all it requires is that c is the square root of t divided by mu. Then I bet you a month's salary that any single valued function will satisfy this differential equation. What is the dimension of that C? What is the dimension of that C? Meters per second. It's a velocity. Because if I have apples here, I must also have apples there. And so this can only be an apple if C has the dimension of a velocity. So therefore, you might as well write this as plus or minus vt, and you may as might as well write v for here, a velocity, and we might as well change now this differential equation in a way more, in a way more uniform way, which is what I'm going to do now, which is 1 over v squared, times d2y dt squared equals d2y dx squared. And this equation is what is generally called the wave equation. It will be with us until the end of the course, until death do us part. It is really a big moment because you're going to see this equation 
many times for many different systems, but now you have seen it being derived for this very specific case. 